I'm going to tell the story of two events. One, the building of a 74-foot motor yacht by two men, myself and Chester Graber, and two, the city of Chicago taking possession of this vessel and towing it to their pound. The first part of this story started in 1975 when Chester, a steel salesman, and his wife, Edith, thought they would build a boat to call their home and cruise the coasts of Florida. Being in the steel business gave them a discount on the materials, and starting from the keel, built the hall at the now-closed Reich's Ship and Boat Yard, located in Chicago on the Illinois Shipping Canal off Cicero and 42nd Street. Chester died 14 years later. His dream thwarted when he got liver cancer. His personal physician, who also had a boat in the yard, told me it was due to breathing welding fumes. When I went to Florida to buy the engines, I talked to a marine engineer on how this hull I bought had been built with 11-inch wide, 10-foot long steel plating instead of using larger sheets, and he said he couldn't believe it. All that welding would have been an insurmountable amount of work, and Chester welded these plates 100% on both sides. Anything larger would have been too heavy to handle. I know, because when I added the nine feet to the back, I did it the same way. The progress of the project was chronicled in a scrapbook Edith gave me, showing the boat with Chester usually standing in the foreground. The earliest of these pictures shows Chester, a virile, proud, and determined looking man in his mid-forties with black hair. Another picture, dated a year later, showed the bow's ribs jetting up and flaring gracefully outward that would become the shape of the hull. And so it went, another picture, another year, and finally the last few showing Chester with mostly gray hair, slim and gaunt, consigned most likely as a titan smile revealed he was not going to finish his boat. Chester told Edith before he died the hall would be her retirement, worth $200,000, which was the asking price when she first put the boat for sale. For two years she tried to sell the hall, every three months reducing the price to a final dismal $10,000 scrap value, which is what I paid for it. I bought the boat one day before the boatyard was going to take possession of it for the $6,000 Edith owed in back rent and have it cut up and scrapped. I remember the ad reading, 65-foot beautiful motor yacht, three cabins, crew quarters, must see, $10,000. She told me how grateful she was someone bought it, that her husband's dream would live on and how desperately she needed the $4,000. Chester loved working on the boat and he was happiest at the yard, she told me. He would get a section done, and her job was to wire brush and prime the areas. They were going to name the boat Venture, because it was such an adventure for them.
I stayed in contact with Edith, and she came to the project whenever she could get a ride, was there when the boat was launched, and came on numerous boating trips. One night, we were cruising down the Chicago River, and Edith accepted my offer to steer for a while. Only momentarily distracted, I looked up, and we were heading straight for the seawall. Edith crashing this boat would have been the ultimate irony. The people who knew Chester at the boatyard described him as quiet and intense. If there was life after death, I would see some apparition as he would surely return to the boat. I looked for him often, but he never came. The interior walls and floors I had been building were hiding his rough framing, and after 10 years, the boat was becoming mine. I wanted to thank him and say I was sorry. Chester and Edith were a couple who for 14 years had sacrificed. For Chester, his industry and hard work. For Edith, the missed opportunity for a normal life. Looking at this vessel for the first time, I saw the pathos in this dead end. The anchor set in its cleats on the bow, the rope secured in the rope locker, ready to sail, but no engines. A bathtub installed against the only wall in an empty room, but no water tank. The three-foot props in their shipping crates, but no shafts to mount them. Signs of hope, promise, and innocence. I owned a 1959 30-foot wooden Richardson whose old-style built-in side table and benches made it cramped and uncomfortable to be in. But then I was invited onto a 40-foot houseboat whose center room had a couch, coffee table to put your feet up, galley aft, and bedroom stern that was docked on the north branch of the Chicago River at Bond's Boatyard off Irving Park in Rockwell. The difference between living on the water with its quiet, serene, natural beauty compared to an apartment or house was very alluring, and in that one short visit, I decided to find a bigger boat. When I was younger and the Cubs announcer stated outfielder David came and lived on a boat, I instantly thought weirdo. When I was stopped and questioned by two detectives about an apparent break-in while walking down a city street one night, I answered their where do you live question with on a boat and these cryptic cops said what kind of weirdo lives on a boat? And after living on a boat on and off for 15 years can tell you it's not weird, it's desirable. I was 36 years old when I answered Edith's beautiful motor yacht for $10,000 ad and was stunned by what I saw pulling into the boatyard. It was gigantic. Boats always look so much bigger out of the water. 20 foot tall, 65 feet long, and 18 feet wide. It was beautiful with its elegant deck lines trailing downward so slightly near midsection, love boat bow, and traditional design with a height ascends upward going aft instead of the modern snub nose design of one straight height above the deck to squeeze in more living space. It was ugly. There were medium-sized plates welded to the skin to fill in indentations when Chester lost control of either the rib contour or the 11-inch plating. The boat had sat two years since Chester died, and Edith's wire brush and primed hull were starting to rust. The holes drilled into the hull's bottom to drain water were clogged, the standing water rusting the steel. The inside was empty. No engines in the engine room, not a wire or hose. The floors were unfinished. Hidden in a cloth wrap were the expensive brass stuffing boxes that would have to be connected to the shaft tubes to keep the boat watertight. Several portside windows next to the open field had been shot out. 